she came to rest on a snowbank at the side of a highway. A teenage girl who could have been anyone's daughter. Her journey had taken her places no young girl should ever know. But finally, it had brought her home to a small Pennsylvania town she'd never seen before. If only she'd survived, she would finally have known there were people who cared. appeared on the highway in the spring, a young woman, her life cut short, her past and her identity a mystery. Only by finding out who she was could we ever hope to find her killer. I'm Jim Kalstrom, former head of the FBI's New York office. The highway gave the killer a quick and easy escape route, but the trail the FBI used to pursue him was twisted and long. We hoped it wouldn't be a dead end. March 24, 1993, Bellefonte, Pennsylvania. A late snowstorm had held spring at arm's length. On his way to work, a motorist drove down a quiet, snow-lined roadway. But something on the roadside caught his attention. What he saw was unthinkable in this peaceful valley. Pennsylvania State Police were immediately called in. A young woman lay dead on a snowbank near the junction of two major interstates. The county coroner determined the girl had died before she was dumped there. She was wearing only socks, panties, and a sweater. And she was young, high school or college age. But perhaps most disturbing, there was a rope knotted around her neck. And her hands were also bound. District Attorney Ray Grecar was at the scene, appalled by what he saw. What struck me is that uh, someone had not only murdered this young woman, but treated her with such disrespect. The way her body was found uh, haphazardly uh, askew on this pile of snow suggested that she had been just thrown out as if she were nothing more than a piece of uh, refuse uh, along the side of the road. and. Uh, it's something that makes you angry when you see it. Her body was taken away for an autopsy. Soon word of the crime began to spread in this close-knit town of 7,000. It was the first homicide in Bellefonte in 13 years. Like District Attorney Grecar, the townspeople were shocked and outraged. FBI Special Agent Randy Kohick was among them. He was drawn to the case well before the FBI was officially involved. That whole area up there is known as Happy Valley. It's, uh, it's a nice place to raise your kids. I lived there for 12 years. Uh, crimes like this just don't happen there. And needless to say, to have a, a young girl's body dumped in your community uh, is a heinous thing. They were, they were extremely upset, and even more so, they can, wondered whether or not perhaps the, the murderer might live in the community. Detectives searched for anything that might help identify the girl. They found no purse or wallet, and little else. 
And I remember commenting to Trooper Madden that morning that he would be very, very fortunate indeed if he was ever able to even identify this young woman, let alone uh, figure out who murdered her. Trooper Madden of the Pennsylvania State Police would be lead investigator. There was a slight indentation into the snow, about six inches, where the body itself looked like it had been dumped off of some type of object, be it a truck or vehicle, into the berm of the snow. Madden surmised the vehicle had been a truck with a cab fairly high off the ground. Tire tracks nearby would prove him right. They were made by dual wheels, probably the rear wheels of a tractor trailer cab. An evidence technician made plaster casts of the tracks to be sent to the Pennsylvania State Police Lab. Examiners there would attempt to identify the brand and check for anything unusual about them. Then, if a suspect were found and his tires matched the tracks, the casts could help link him to the scene of the crime. Troopers fanned out to find clues. They searched both nearby fields and local Penn State University, but found nothing useful. The body was taken to Lehigh Hospital in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. There, coroner Dr. Mahalakis would perform the autopsy as Trooper Madden observed. The doctor determined the cause of death to be strangulation. There were no gunshot or stab wounds. The body's core temperature revealed the young woman had been dead less than 12 hours when her body was discovered. It seemed she had died some time before she was dumped on the roadside, as the coroner at the scene had guessed. Other tests indicated she had had sex before she died. Whether she was raped or had consensual sex at the time was not known. However, based on the circumstances, we believed at the time that a rape may have occurred. Dr. Mahalakis carefully removed the rope from around the girl's neck. Wait a minute. Right here, Doc. There's a piece of hair, this black hair. Right? Under the knot was a single dark hair. It didn't belong to this blonde girl. But was it the killers? The hair would be sent to the FBI forensics lab in Washington, DC, along with the knots for analysis. The type of knots could be important. They might help the FBI develop a profile of the killer. But the best clue came from the girl's left hand. There appeared to be something written on the palm. She had some faint numbers written on the palm of her left hand. They had been written on uh, possibly uh, in ink, and they'd been on there for some time as they had faded, and they were barely legible. Uh, it was thought by both Bill and myself that uh, possibly this could be the lead we were looking for that could possibly lead us to her identity. Numbers the writing was indecipherable though it looked like it might be numbers. That's pretty faint. Can you get that? Agent Kohick suggested experts at the FBI lab could make them clear enough to read. It was thought that perhaps we could have these enhanced by the FBI lab in Washington, D.C., so the skin was removed from her left hand and it was forwarded to the FBI lab. The girl's fingerprints would be run through a national database of missing persons. But the results would prove disheartening. Checks were made with her fingerprints through the APHIS system, which is a national system of checking fingerprints. Um, they came back negative. Checks were also made using descriptors of the body and uh, characteristics of the body, and that also came back negative. So we had no record of a person missing that matched this person we discovered. Then, x-rays were taken by a forensic dentist. They could be crucial in identifying the woman. If a tentative ID were made and these x-rays matched those taken when the woman was alive, they'd confirm her identity. 
But first, she'd need to be visually identified by someone who knew her in life, which would be difficult after a full autopsy. Closing facial incisions made for the dental x-rays and masking contusions would take hours of painstaking work. To restore her to the way she looked in life would require the artistry of a skilled mortician. Stephen Mondock was just the man for the job. When we received her body, she had been through quite an ordeal. You know, we had to put a little bit of makeup on her. Um, we had to get her hair done. We dressed her. Uh, we made her look as lifelike as possible at that point. Uh, we then proceeded to take photographs that were eventually placed in the newspaper. Those photographs depicted her as more lifelike than she had looked when first found. But Mondock gave her more than a face. He gave her a name. When the coroner brought her in, uh, he said, we have a Jane Doe for you. And I said, Carrie, I said, you know, I, I don't like calling people Jane Doe. I said, it seems so impersonal. He says, well, what are we going to call her? And I said, well, she was found in Spring Township, right? He said, yes. I said, why don't we call her Spring? And I said, well, she was found in the dawn of the morning, so why don't we call her Spring Dawn? Mondock's caring work gave investigators exactly what they needed. They showed photos of the girl to dozens of truckers at local truck stops, restaurants, and gas stations. Some offered the names of people the girl resembled. Her young face struck a chord of recognition in many who saw it. Notices in local papers and on flyers also generated leads. The outpouring uh, of calls to the state police at the time was plentiful, and we had to sift through every lead to try to determine if this person was a local person. But none of the leads would pan out. Then, in late April, about a month after the body was found, the FBI lab called Trooper Madden. Their analysis showed the writing on the girl's left palm was a phone number with a Florida area code. Madden found the number had been disconnected, and he began to wonder if the area code itself was wrong. But it didn't seem right. It didn't seem to fit this particular case. In looking at this person, there was no tan. Um, it seemed as if she came from a winterized area, somewhat similar to where we were. However, we did not know where. Madden's best guess was that she came from west or north of Pennsylvania, probably within a 12-hour drive from where the body was found. Madden also realized that there were two phone numbers written on the girl's hand, not just one. So he noted all the cities within the 12-hour radius that had both the exchanges she'd written down. Madden and Kohik would send the numbers, along with photos and descriptions of the young woman, to sheriffs and state police in those areas. Perhaps the information would trigger some leads. As they worked the case, the people of Bellefonte followed each new development, offering help and support. There was a, a genuine showing of, of affection for this person and concern. I, I guess you could say she was posthumously adopted by the, the community of Belfont. And, and even though we were very quickly able to ascertain that she was not a local resident, there was still a very uh, strong sense of uh, she is someone that we cared about. As spring bloomed for Belafonte, the girl remained in people's thoughts. Her story touched everyone, especially Madden and Kohik. These colleagues and longtime friends could not stop thinking about her tragic death and trying to solve the case even after hours. At the time I was assigned to this case, I had a 17-year-old daughter, and Detective Madden had two teenage daughters. So I think for the both of us, we took a very strong personal interest in the case. As a matter of fact, it pretty much took up all of our time during our working hours, and we would often find ourselves talking to each other at night on the phone at our residences. Never was community support so strong 
is when Stephen Mondock began to prepare the body for burial. I had florists call donating flowers. I had hairdressers calling to do her hair. I had people donating clothing. I had ministers willing to give their services. Uh, the vault company, the casket companies, the um, cemetery where she was to be buried was actually at the bottom of a beautiful mountain where there's wildflowers growing. Uh, we had the, the monument company had uh, donated, was willing to donate a stone to bury her. Um, it was just amazing how much the town all came together in an effort to bury her. More than a month after the body was found, it was time for a burial. Not only did the town want to bring closure to the tragedy, the body could not be preserved much longer. Still, Madden needed just a little more time. The last thing that we wanted to do as a police agency was to lose the body. In other words, we did not want the body buried at that point in time without identification. Just when the body could be kept no longer, a break in the case finally came. A sheriff's office in Maine received Madden's information packet on the girl. Though he didn't recognize her face, he called one of the numbers written on the girl's hand. He had no idea who might answer the phone. He reached Mark Rosenberg, a guidance counselor at a local school. Promising, given the girl's age, Detective Staples. Thanks so much for meeting with me. Tonight. A detective visited Rosenberg and his wife at their home. I'd like to see if you can help me identify the woman in this. When the detective showed the Rosenbergs a photo of the girl, they immediately recognized her. Can you look at that photo, please. And when they spoke her name, it was eerily familiar. Dawn. Dawn Marie Birnbaum. Steve Mondock's choice of the name Spring Dawn had been uncannily accurate. And I was shocked. I was amazed. It was just a strange, strange, strange coincidence. But it felt right. She was part of our community. Mark Rosenberg was one of the last people Dawn talked to before she died. Investigators hoped he could lead them closer to her killer. After a search that stretched from Florida to Maine, investigators had learned the identity of a teenage girl found dead near a rural Pennsylvania interstate. As they spoke to Mark Rosenberg, a guidance counselor at the school she had attended, he said she'd called him just days before she died from a payphone. He'd tried to help her, but it was already too late. The school she attended was mainly for at-risk teens, like Dawn herself. She'd had problems with authority figures ever since her parents' divorce. In Indiana, where her mother lived, she'd been through a dozen foster homes and run away almost as many times. But at this boarding school, she'd finally found someone she could trust, her counselor, Mr. Rosenberg. As Mr. Rosenberg was uh, talking to Dawn, uh, the operator was interrupting, telling her to put more money in. Time was running out, and uh, Mr. Rosenberg told Dawn to uh, call him again so he would know she was safe. She said she would do that. He gave her his uh, home telephone number, which obviously she then wrote on the palm of her hand. She said she'd call back, but in fact, uh, she never did call again. The school would send Dawn's dental records to Pennsylvania, where forensic dentists would match them to x-rays taken at the morgue. The result would be a positive ID and a turning point in the case. The FBI entered the case officially under our kidnapping statute. Obviously, we had a girl who was found in central Pennsylvania laying in a snow pile, tied up, uh, and who had previously been seen just a few days earlier in the state of Maine. So we have the interstate aspect. Now we are aware that the investigation focused in Maine, where Dawn was last seen alive. Maine State Police officers interviewed Dawn's friends, including Heidi Hansen. Heidi told them Dawn had been planning to hitch a ride with a truck driver, as she'd done about a year before. On that occasion, Dawn and another friend, Mandy Gray, had run off with a trucker named John Hoffpower. 
They dropped off Mandy at her home in Georgia, then continued on. What had started as a ride became a relationship. As the weeks passed, they grew closer. In the woman of my life, Dawn. He's been waiting weeks to see you. Hoffpower took Dawn home to meet his grandmother. They continued to travel together, driving his roots. No one knew exactly where they'd gone or what they'd done. But Dawn spoke fondly of her time with Hoffpower. They'd enjoyed each other's company, and he had treated her well. It seemed one of the few happy times in her troubled life. Then, about a month after Dawn was last seen, the truck was pulled over by police in a random traffic stop. An officer demanded Dawn get out. She complied. When she gave him her license, it triggered a missing persons bulletin filed by her school. The officer told Dawn she'd have to come with him. When he tried to take her away from Hoffpower, she pleaded to stay, to no avail. Police would bring her back to school. Since then, her behavior had been good, and she was due to graduate in just a few months but things were not as they seemed. Apparently, Hoffpower was still in love with her, and maybe she with him. Though she hadn't seen him since their trip, he had tried to visit her at school. Listen, I'm sorry, you can't get in here. But security guards had kept him from entering the grounds. You got no clearance to come in here. Not having heard from him in a while, Dawn now told friends she was going to look for Hoffpower and run away with him again. On the evening of Sunday, March 21st, three days before Dawn was found dead, she had snuck off from a movie theater. She told her friend Heidi she would hitchhike to the Dysart truck stop in Bangor, Maine, hoping to meet Hoffpower. Hoffpower now became a prime suspect, since Dawn was last seen headed to meet him. Agent Kohick attempted to track him down. Apparently, he lived in Mississippi. But Hoffpower proved elusive. The closest relative agents found was his grandmother, who lived in Emory, Mississippi. She welcomed them inside and told them she'd raised Hoffpower as her own son. He was devoted to her. No matter where he was, he called her almost every day. He had even brought Dawn home to meet her. Now, when agents told the woman of Dawn's violent death, she was devastated. Then, she shared with him her own tragic news. Last September, a half year before Dawn's murder, her grandson had stopped calling her. He'd also stopped working and taking care of his pets. He'd left his wallet in his house and disappeared. His grandmother believed he was dead, though his body was never found. His car was found riddled with bullets, and uh, there was some reason to think that he had gotten into some trouble with some very unsavory characters and had met a violent end. Agents learned his car had been found in September 1992, a few miles from his Mississippi home, seven months prior to Dawn's death. By a strange twist of fate, Hoffpower's disappearance had led to Dawn's death. If Hoffpower had arrived at Dysart's, Dawn would still be alive. Their star-crossed love affair had ended in a double tragedy. Now, with Hoffpower presumed dead, 
investigators struggle to find Don's killer was almost back to square one. Investigators' most promising lead had gone cold. They again had no suspect in a chilling case. The death of a beautiful 17-year-old girl left dead on a rural Pennsylvania roadside. On a tip from Don's friend, Agent Kohick and Trooper Madden went to the Dysart truck stop in Bangor, Maine, where Dawn had said she was headed when she was last seen. How are you? I'm Detective Madden. I wonder if we could ask a few questions. They showed Dawn's photograph to the cashier, who remembered seeing her on the telephone a few weeks earlier. She was over there. Surprisingly enough, even though two months had elapsed, uh, agents discovered that people recalled seeing the young blonde girl there standing at the doorway asking truckers for rides as they walked through. Uh, she was recalled by several people at the truck stop. And I, I guess when uh, you know, you're a young teenage girl and uh, you're, you're out on the road like that, people take notice. It seemed obvious this was where Dawn had made her last phone calls. This cashier's desk where a trucker would pay for fuel was only about 15 feet from the bank of uh, pay telephones which Dawn had used to make calls back home and down to the school. So it was easy to visualize how an encounter would have occurred between Dawn and a trucker. Agent Kohick secured a federal grand jury subpoena for the telephone records. Yes. Going through them would be a painstaking task, but it was the most promising option in a case fast running out of leads. The people Dawn had called might know where she had been going or who she was going with. The phone records confirmed Dawn's call to her guidance counselor, Mark Rosenberg, in Maine. They also revealed she'd phoned other friends. It seemed her last call was at 10 a.m. to Mandy Gray, the girl who'd traveled with Dawn and Hofbauer. A state trooper visited Mandy at her home in Georgia. Mandy confirmed Dawn had called her from the Dysart's truck stop. Dawn said she'd gotten a ride to Dysart's from a friendly trucker who'd given her money for food when he dropped her off. Mandy said her friend had been disappointed that she hadn't found Hofpower there. She seemed to have no one else to turn to and nowhere to go. If she headed toward Indiana, where her mother lived, she feared authorities would be looking for her. Based on the conversation she had had with her uh, girlfriend in Georgia, Trooper Madden and I reasoned that she had obtained a ride with a truck driver from Dysart's truck stop. At that point, I decided it would be best if we attempted to identify who may have stopped there for gas over that several day period. And so I had a federal grand jury subpoena issued for all the receipts from the truck stop for approximately a four day period surrounding when Dawn was last seen there. Meanwhile, Trooper Madden obtained receipts for the three truck stops closest to where Dawn's body was found in Pennsylvania. They hoped that whoever had given Dawn a ride had bought gas in both places. It was possible. The distance from Bangor to Belafonte is just over 650 miles, but not probable. A big rig can easily travel 1,500 miles or more on a single filling. Undoubtedly, it was a long shot, but Kohick and Madden nonetheless began the painstaking task of scanning thousands of gas receipts. Over approximately the next four weeks, I compiled the receipts from Maine and from Pennsylvania and ended up with two separate lists. After com comparing one list against the other, I noticed there was only one match on the entire list of several thousand names. The name was James Robert Cruz, Jr. Cruz had bought gas on the morning of March 22nd at Dysart's truck stop just as Dawn was talking on the telephone 15 feet away. Three days later, he gassed up again in Milesburg, Pennsylvania, just a few hours before Dawn's body was found nearby. So this was a big breakthrough for us. We have a guy who's 
in Bangor when Dawn is in Bangor and in central Pennsylvania right about the time her body is found. The receipt showed James Robert Cruz Jr. worked at an Ohio trucking company. In response to a call from Agent Kodak, his manager verified the credit card purchases. Okay, I've got the records. And Cruz was driving truck 44 on a route consistent with the events of the crime. Uh, got the times, got the dates. Got Agent Kohick and Trooper Madden now had a suspect in the killing of 17-year-old Dawn Marie Birnbaum. Okay, that sounds good to me too. Exactly. Investigators pursued their prime suspect, wanted for the murder of a 17-year-old high school girl morning, whose we'll body was dumped sounds near good. a Pennsylvania interstate. Mm -hmm. The man was a trucker named James Robert Cruz, Jr. His manager mm -hmm. told the FBI he was a model employee at exactly. an Ohio trucking company. Uh, this is the follow but investigators the found he had a and, dark uh, past. Yeah, it turns out I had a criminal history check run in the next few minutes and was able to determine that he had a rather lengthy criminal record. Most importantly on that criminal record was the fact that he had been in the U.S. military and while in the U.S. military, he had been convicted of attempted murder via strangulation and had served time in Fort Leavenworth for that conviction. His military records gave investigators another key fact. We found that his blood type was A positive, which fit him into the small portion of the population, which uh, would be a possible source of the seminal fluid found in, in Dawn. It seemed investigators were closing in on their suspect. There's only one thing left that we could do to further attempt to identify whether he might have been the individual responsible for this murder, and that was to make a determination as to what type of tires he had on his truck. At Agent Kohick's request, an Ohio FBI agent inspected the tires on truck 44 while Cruz was on the road in another rig. The tires were XD1, Michelin, low profiles, a fairly unusual brand. At the Pennsylvania State Police Lab, an examiner attempted to match that brand to the tire cast made where Don's body was found. He compared the cast to detailed photographs in a tire reference guide. They matched. Another breakthrough in the case. So we had a match on the tires, we had a match on the blood, we had the fuel slips. This at this point, according to the United States Attorney's Office, was sufficient to put together a search warrant to search Jim's truck and to also perhaps take blood and uh, hair samples from his body for DNA analysis. When Cruz was again away in another rig, FBI evidence recovery technicians examined truck 44. But if Dawn had in fact been in this truck, it would have been at least two months ago. So investigators didn't expect to find much. The fact that the truck was exceptionally clean didn't make them any more optimistic. The search took pretty much the entire day, and it was an exhaustive search. We were, we were searching both the tractor and the, the trailer itself. Uh, there were over 300 pictures taken of the tractor trailer. But nothing turned up. An evidence technician was about to declare the search complete when something caught the investigator's eye. And I looked at the passenger door and noticed that at the bottom of the door there was a piece of carpeting and upon closer examination of the carpeting, I noticed one single blonde head hair interwoven in the fibers of the carpet. You see something? It seemed amazing, but there it was, as if Dawn had not been quite ready to give up yet. What is it? It's a blonde hair. The hair would be sent to the FBI lab for analysis. My thought 
it was a little bit too good to be true that this could be a hair from Dawn. What do you expect them, Joe? Now, investigators waited for Cruz to return from his run. Mr. Cruz, James Cruz? They told him they were looking for a runaway last seen at a truck stop in Bangor, Maine. Do you mind, do you mind if we use your office? No, no, right, right. now, right there on it. Thanks, Joe. They implied Thanks, they were Joe. talking to many drivers. Take a seat right here in the chair. Yeah, we, uh, we know you have a they asked to see Cruz's logbook for his record of travels on the days in question. The logs are government mandated to keep truckers from driving too many hours at a time. Cruz admitted he'd falsified his logs. Is pretty accurate? Well, you know, it's... it's truckers commonly alter them to stay within legal limits. But it seemed Cruz's logs had been selectively altered. But the one thing we noticed was that the misrepresentations in the log seemed to occur just conveniently when the fuel was purchased in Pennsylvania, also when the fuel was purchased in Dysert's. I'm sorry. In response to questions, Cruz calmly described his route. But when asked if he fueled up between Bangor and Pennsylvania, he said he didn't have to. The 240 gallons his truck could carry was enough for the trip. I then suggested to him that uh, I had a fuel slip indicating that he had, in fact, filled up his truck on Wednesday morning. He paused for a second and uh, then advised that he did, in fact, recall doing that. And it was due to the fact that uh, they gave free showers away at that particular truck stop in Mossberg. I asked him why he hadn't remembered it, and he said to me, well, I guess I, I just forgot. Mr. Cruz, we have a, uh, we'll a short picture of then. this. They showed him a photo of Dawn. We asked him if he had ever seen this girl before. At that point in time, he very calmly and casually stated no, he had never seen this girl. He didn't know her, nor had he ever met her before in his life. They told him they had strong evidence linking him to the crime. Dawn's phone calls from Bangor that coincided with his stop over there. The match of his truck tires to the tire tracks at the scene. And the match of his blood type to the type found on the body. He calmly chalked it all up to coincidence. At no point during the interview did any of his mannerisms uh, uh, indicate that uh, he was at all nervous with, with my line of questioning. And uh, as the night slowly went on, I think even uh, Detective Madden agreed that uh, he became less of a suspect for us, even though we had all this circumstantial evidence. He was just too calm and cooperative. Do you have any problem with that? <clears throat> Not at all. Cruz remained friendly, even when investigators produced a warrant for blood and hair samples. They would later learn from FBI profilers that such an excessively calm response can be a sign of guilt. On September 6th, Results of the blood and hair analysis proved them right. The samples from Cruz matched the hair and DNA the killer had left behind on Dawn's body. With that evidence in hand, agents obtained a federal arrest warrant for James Robert Cruz, Jr. The FBI and the Pennsylvania State Police had identified the man who had brutally raped and murdered a young woman. On September 8, 1993, with a federal arrest warrant, Agent Kohick and Trooper Madden arrested James Robert Cruz, Jr. when he returned from another trucking run. As they made the arrest, Cruz suddenly dropped his easygoing attitude. One of the differences between the initial interview of Mr. Cruz and the arrest of Mr. Cruz was his demeanor. No longer was he the cool, calm, and collected person he had been during the initial interview that we had with him. Instead, Mr. Cruz appeared to be very sullen and was angry towards both Agent Kohick and myself. Cruz's arrest 
was the reward for determined investigators, committed to catching the killer of a girl who could have been anyone's daughter. Just six months earlier, investigators had only a body in the snow near an interstate with no ID. He was charged with first, second, and third degree murder, rape, kidnapping, and the federal charge of unlawful flight to avoid prosecution. But I'd like to take a few minutes here. For Dawn, the nightmare started as an adventure. On Sunday, March 21st, she left her friend Heidi at a movie theater near their school in Poland Springs, Maine. Dawn headed for Bangor, where she hoped to meet John Hofbauer. A friendly trucker gave her a ride. She and John had been separated for months, and she looked forward to seeing him. But he wasn't there. She could not have known he was missing and presumed dead. Instead, her life would intersect with that of a much more sinister man. James Robert Cruz, Jr. Dawn spent the day of March 22nd making calls at the Dysart truck stop in Bangor. She telephoned friends, letting them know where she was and that she was safe. She also talked to her school counselor, Mark Rosenberg, to say she'd run away, but was fine and promised to call him that evening. She wrote his numbers on her hand for safekeeping. When James Robert Cruz paid for his gas, he saw Dawn on the phone, just 15 feet from the cash register. Okay. All right, well, we'll keep in touch, okay? All right, bye. Cruz signed the credit card receipt, billing the gas to his employer in Ohio. It didn't take much to convince him to give her a ride. She and Cruz would head south. Prosecutors reconstructed the events that had led to Don Birnbaum's death. She had no idea of the danger that lay ahead. The hours she spent with James Robert Cruz would be her last. While Dawn prepared to sleep for the night, Cruz was still awake, falsifying his logbook. Dawn would soon find herself a helpless captive, trapped by a cruel predator with no escape. Late on March 23rd, Cruz raped and strangled her probably in the sleeping compartment of his truck.
that same night after buying gas in Pennsylvania, he disconnected his cab from his trailer at the travel park. He drove away, looking for a place to leave Dawn's body. Cruz drove through the backwoods of Pennsylvania, anxious to dump the lifeless girl. In the wee hours of March 24th, he pulled over to the side of the road. He pushed Dawn's body out of the truck and onto the side of a highway entrance ramp. Cruz almost certainly believed he'd never be caught. And if not for dedicated investigators, advanced forensics testing, and plain good luck, he might easily have gotten away with murder. District Attorney Ray Grecar served as prosecutor. And one point that I wanted to emphasize to the jury was how long it took Dawn to die at the hands of James Cruz. The pathologist testified that uh, from the moment the rope was knotted around her neck, it took four minutes for her to die. Grecar's approach was effective. On June 14th, after 14 hours of deliberation, the jury found James Robert Cruz Jr. guilty of first degree murder. The judge sentenced Cruz immediately to life in prison without parole. He is serving his time at the Greene County Maximum Security Prison in Western Pennsylvania. The legacy of this investigation, I would say, is, is the fact that at the beginning of the investigation, all we had was a, a young girl laying in a snow pile who had died a death no one should have to die. No identification on her for the most part, and, and a, a very strong concern among law enforcement agencies that she would not ever be identified, much less have the killer caught and convicted. But it seemed Kohik and Madden may have performed an even greater service than they first realized. Sequenced with, with what we've got. At the time of the arrest, there was a lot of media interest in Cruz because uh, in his own home state of Ohio, there had been a number of young women found along the highways and on-ramps over the previous year or two, and who had been uh, uh, tied up as well and left along on ramps. A review of our VICAP database indicated over the previous 10 years there were approximately 600 young women that were found along the highways and uh, who had died uh, in a suspicious manner. We were not able to conclusively state that Mr. Cruz was involved in any of these murders. What we do know is that after the arrest of Mr. Cruz, the murders that we were talking about in the state of Ohio ceased. For Don Birnbaum, peace had finally come. The gentle people of Bellefonte will always remember her and the killer who took her life and changed theirs forever. <laughs>